Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight um, for our symposium on Passaic County flooding, impact and response. I'm Kathleen Waldron, president of William Patterson University, and I'm so glad to see so many members of our community with us um, this evening. It promises to be an interesting conversation and forum for um, about the scientific and public policy implications of flooding in the Passaic River Basin. Um, the university is proud to be an active partner in our community. We are especially pleased to host this forum for a discussion of flooding in the Passaic River Basin, and I want to give special thanks to local, state, and federal officials who join us for this evening's panel discussions. I'd also like to thank the Passaic County Board of Chosen Freeholders and Deb Hoffman, Deb, stand up. There she is. Uh, the director of the Passaic County Office of Economic Development, really for joining with our university and our College of Science and Health um, for planning this conference. Uh, she has worked very hard with Sandra DeYoung, the dean um, who has uh, of our College of Science and Health, who has co-sponsored this event. And I also want to acknowledge and recognize Provost Ed Weil, the chief academic officer of the university, who has also um, put a great effort into planning for this conference. Now, to start the program, I'm pleased to introduce a short film that was developed by uh, William Patterson alumnus Michael DiLorenzo. The film chronicles the severe impact that repeated flooding from the Passaic River has and its tributaries has had on local residents and businesses. So we're going to watch this movie for a few minutes and then I'll come back up and introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Anything that reduces the flood peak, that is, keeps the water in the upland areas faster and releases the water at a slower rate will reduce the flood peak downstream. I know that there's some efforts being made in Passaic County to uh, get the funding, federal funding, to do some of the work. I can't understand why they just don't put more federal money to clean up these rivers, get rid of the problem. The water all gets downstream eventually. The question is when. And by reducing the flood peak, you make that flood wave more manageable and less destructive downstream. In most, in, in most you know, heavy rains and, and minor flooding in the neighborhood, we're okay. But, uh, you know, Irene was certainly the, the exception. You know, we just, uh, you know, watch, watch the water rise as it normally does. It comes up the side street and around the corner, and <clears throat> it just kept rising and rising. And at one point, we're just like, um, we can't stay here. And we had the... Uh, Five-day-old baby. Yeah. So we... Uh, we had to call the was the uh, fire department to send a boat here to get us. So ridiculous. I understand that the governor agreed to lower Pompton Lake by a few feet to create an empty basin for Irene to dump into. And by doing that, he saved our first floor because those few feet would have been in my in the space we're sitting in now, which is our living space. How many times in a year can you be flooded and be expected to pay your $2,000 or $4,000 um, deductible and rebuild your home only to have it flood two months later or three months later? You know, specifically for the, this house, but we've also spoken with neighbors who were here for, you know, you know, many years before, and it all seems to be related to the dam you know, operation, right? This, this location, uh, we typically would have 165 uh, preschoolers, three and four year olds with the Patterson School District, and up to 120 infants and toddlers. Uh, so a total of uh, almost 285 children. Um, the total damage, uh, and, and just in cleaning out, decontaminating, uh, and then the restoration and replacing the equipment in, in 12 classrooms and a playroom is, is gonna exceed a million dollars. We have insurance, we have flood insurance. Uh, it will not cover the entire costs. The, the work that's already been done to decontaminate, to get the mold out, to get all the other contaminants out of the building uh, is, uh, is probably in the ballpark of, of three quarter million dollars. Uh, and, and that's not begun to uh, replace any of the walls or flooring or, or, or there's certainly not any of the equipment yet. And here in Patterson, there's a, uh, such a shortage of infant toddler care. 
our center was, uh, this site was the largest provider of infant toddler care in, in the area, and, uh, and it's been down now for several months. People are, are scurrying to find out what to do with their babies if they have to go to work. Uh, and, and I don't have any way to tell what some of them are doing. I know we've been able to re relocate, as I said, some of the families uh, to our other site, but uh, I, I'm not sure what, what the others are doing. It took uh, at least four to f five weeks to, uh, that they were in here doing uh, uh, extensive dry out and, and, and decontamination and, and removing the, uh, you know, the contaminated sheetrock and floorboards and, and ceiling tiles. We applied to FEMA for some assistance as, as a school. Uh, they told us that school wasn't in session uh, at the end of the summer, the weekend, whenever it was they hit, uh, and, uh, and, and denied us. The water was around for a good two and a half weeks, I would say. Um, it, it hindered our ability to ship to our customers. We have had three major floods in the last 30 years. So, you know, a hundred year flood zone shouldn't have every 10 years a massive flood. We were lucky to be insured because the bill was uh, $800,000 to clean up the basement. Um, we're a paper company, so imagine, you know, 200 pallets or 300 pallets that we lost in the basement that is all just printed paper. Uh, it was just mush. The, there was seven feet of water in the street. The pressure against our building of that much water in the street just blew a hole right into our building and the hole was so, it, it, I mean water is such a s strong force that it literally took a chunk of the wall, blew it through another and collapsed an entire cement wall. Um, that's how forceful that water was and, and filled our basement. They came in and spent three weeks here, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three weeks, and they had about 50 people. And they cleaned up, took away all the debris, took away all the waste, uh, cleaned our basement floors and our walls, and uh, really left the place in great shape. Um, but it was a very expensive thing to do. You know, when they see how often this area floods, they're liable to say we're not going to insure you anymore. Uh, we'd like to stay here. You know, we have a great workforce, mostly from Patterson. Uh, it's a great city. And uh, I think it's really, you know, ridiculous that we haven't done something about the water issue. Hurricane Irene, we got 27 inches of water. And uh, basically, we were shut down from August 27th to November 11th. We wanted people to know that it's the first time we ever flooded here since 1988. We decided to do a full remodel because we serve food and we want people to know that, you know, we didn't just paint walls, we gutted everything and we made it new. Irina, our total structural payout was 41000 um, and the contents, our contents limit is is 11,000, so that's what it was. We had more than double that in contents loss. We weren't prepared for four feet. We were prepared for two feet. We had barriers set to two feet. We had everything moved two feet or so off the floor. We knew that in 84, this house got less than two feet, so we thought, you know, worst that happens, okay, we had everything up, we had the couch up on blocks, you know, everything stacked up. We didn't expect that the water would be high enough to float and tip the furniture. We bought this house, there was no claims history on it at all. Talking to neighbors, we found that it did flood in 84, but everything flooded in 84. So that, you know, that was expected. Um, and when we made the repairs in 2010, we did find some evidence that there had been previous repairs. But other than that, um, you know, we knew we were buying a house that didn't flood seasonally. We knew we were in the 100-year floodplain, and if something really catastrophic happened, we would flood. We took the insurance, but we were not, certainly not expecting to be worrying about flooding every spring. The people we bought the home from lived here for, I think, 13 years and never had water. It was a very frightening situation to realize uh, that we couldn't get out under our own power. And I will not let my family be in that situation again. I can't, I can't do it to my kids. I wanna see mitigation. I wanna see the reservoirs regulated in a way that helps flood 
victims. I want to see development control because if we don't get development control, we're looking at such long-term problems. We're chasing our tail if we don't get development control. And we will never get ahead of the solution, get ahead of the problem, if we don't start controlling upland development. The flooding itself is, is made worse by development in the uplands. The greater the water runs off um, from impervious areas on the hillsides, the faster it gets down to the lowlands. So the development makes the flooding worse that way. But the development in the floodplains means the impact of that flooding is greater. We have discussed not being able to plan on being anywhere but home from late February until early May. We need to be here to monitor our, our, our home. This is a community where people do help with that and people do just show up and give you a hand and walk you through what to do and make sure that you get things back in order and help guide you in fighting with the insurance companies because it's always a fight. This is a community that I feel really, really is worth protecting. It's not even a matter now of what we want, it's what we need. There's no way to solve the flooding problem short of getting the people out of the way of the floods. And that's just not a feasible solution. Um, it's also not feasible to stop the floods. I mean, that would involve holding all the water back. So there must be some solution that incorporates everything we can in terms of um, reducing the flood wave, getting people out of the way, or hardening, or making structures less flood prone. So any one of those individually is gonna cost money. Together they will all cost a bunch of money. It has to be balanced though against the benefits from having people living that close to the water or the, the aesthetic benefits that come from having people there. So it's a, it's a trading balance, trading, it's a trade off between profit and cost. Um, I, I really want to thank Michael DiLorenzo and Clark Mayer for this movie. I, it took a lot of time to do it. They also found uh, clearly uh, people from our community, many of our neighbors and friends, uh, to get a firsthand account of what um, the impact of that was on people's homes and on our businesses. We now move to the next part of our symposium uh, for the talk by our keynote speaker. Uh, Jeffrey Hoffman, who you've already met in the movie, is a research scientist with the New Jersey Geological and Water Survey, a research branch of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. He is currently chief of the Water Supply Modeling and Planning Section and has more than 30 years of experience in New Jersey water supply and drought issues. He has also spent several years studying the hydrogeology of the Central Passaic River Basin. Uh, please join me in welping, welcoming Jeffrey Hoffman to give our keynote address at this conference. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much to everyone involved in planning this conference for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here tonight. This is sort of a, a homecoming for me. I did spend a lot of work um, at the start of my career in the um, Central Basin. I did a lot of work on the Buried Valley Aquifers um, in, in, the, in the area. I also did a bunch of work analyzing um, the proposed Passaic Flood Tunnel that was on the books for a number of years um, in the 80s and 90s. But I am with the uh, Geological and Water Survey, and I was trained as a geologist. So um, it's appropriate for me to talk about the geologic controls on flooding in the Passaic Basin. Um, where to start the geologic history? I could go back about 480 million years ago. At this time, the Eurasian and North American tectonic plates had just collided. The resultant collision threw up the Appalachian Mountains. At that time, they were as high as the Himalayas are right now. They were huge peaks along, and now they're not nearly quite as tall. Erosion has taken its um, time and has worn them down to mere nubbins compared to what they were. I could go back about 200 million years ago. At that time, the two plates were pulling apart. And as they pulled apart, cracks in the mantle allowed lava to flow up to the land surface. This lava flowed out over the surface and then hardened to form a, um, a unit we call diabase. Oh, it's a very hard rock, very erosion resistant. As time went on, 
the, this dive-based units were covered by later sediments, and then the, the ocean got wider and wider. Later processes tilted um, these units, the result being that the, um, the dive base now sticks up. It resists erosion, and it now forms the Watching Mountains, the highlands in the area. The Precambrian rocks to the west are also a highlands, and you have the lower, softer sedimentary rocks in between. But I don't really want to start that far back. I only want to go back about 30,000 years. We are right now in the Quaternary era. This is a glacial period. Glaciers have advanced down from the North Pole a number of times over the last two and a half million years. The Wisconsin Glacier, the most recent one, 30 to 10,000 years ago. Before that, Illinoisan. Before that, there were several other glacial periods. It's hard, though, to really interpret the older periods because each successive glacier as it comes down from the, from the north wipes away what's in front of it, erases the evidence. It makes it hard for geologists to figure out the, exactly what went on. But the, our story really starts here about um, uh, 15, 30,000 years ago. At that time, the, this is what New Jersey probably looked like at that time. What you can, it looks very much, we think, like it looks now. The big difference is that the Passaic River isn't there. The Passaic River is not flowing out of the basin at Little Falls and over the Great Falls where it does now. Instead, it flowed out of the basin further to the south at the Short Hills Gap. The Short Hills Gap is a major break in the Watching Mountains where the dive base has been eroded away and it's just not there. It's a much bedrock is much lower in the Short Hills Gap. But we think that the Passaic River at that time flowed out of the Short Hills Gap and then down to some place in, in the, um, the Newark Bay. So it was a different drainage pattern. About 30, 20,000 years ago, which is, to a geologist, quite recent. That's just like the blink of an eye ago in terms of geologic time. This is what New Jersey looked like. All of the northern third of New Jersey was covered with ice. Perhaps North New Jersey looked like this. New York maybe looked like this. Maybe some, a few mountain peaks sticking out, out of the ice. Where the ice was thick enough, it was just flat. There were no mountains sticking up. South Jersey looked like this in the winter. Here's a reindeer on tundra trying to find something to eat. This is what South Jersey would have looked like in the winter. And southern New Jersey in the spring. What we have here is um, tundra flowers blooming. And then off to the north, um, you have some ice-covered features. And the meltwater is coming off of the ice and then flowing away from the area that's still frozen um, further south. At this time, there were animals on the tundra. There were mastodons, the muskox. There were giant beavers, beavers that were nine feet long, 200 pounds, the size of black bears. Feeding on these would have been dire wolves, American lions, and saber-toothed tigers. All of these creatures would have roamed New Jersey 15,000 years ago. There was also, however, an even more deadlier predator. Humans arrived on this continent. Now, when there's a bunch of evidence to indicate that when humans arrived on a continent, that is roughly at the same time this megafauna was all became extinct. Um, archaeologists have found a mastodon skeleton in Arizona that had arrow points in its ribs. So we know that early humans did prey upon this large megafauna. Did they cause extinction or not? Or was it climate change or something else? We just don't know. But it's a very interesting question. Let's get back to the geology of, the hist of this area. Um, as the glacier came down from the north, it disrupted what was going on before. It, it disrupted the drainage patterns. It disrupted the land surface. It scooped up all the sediments. And a lobe of ice, a little faster, traveled down to the east of the first Washington Mountain, a little faster than the central part. And what that did is it blocked off the ancestral Passaic's flow path. Instead of being able to flow east out of the um, Short Hills Gap, the water was backed up, creating what we call Glacial Lake Passaic. At its, at its maximum extent, the, um, the glacier came down here and left behind the terminal moraine marking its furthest extent. Lake, glacial Lake Passaic then extended in the basin further south, 
bounded to the east by the Watching Mountains and the south, and to the west by the highlands. It was up to 340, um, uh, sorry, an elevation of 340, about 200 feet deep uh, at its maximum. Um, this lake would have frozen over in the winter, but in the spring and summer, the ice would have melted and on the top of the lake, and the meltwater coming off of the glacier would have filled the lake um, to its outlet elevation. Water flowed out of the lake through Moggy Hollow, which is near Bernardsville. If you've ever driven Route 287 up from the Somerville area, you followed the outlet's course of Glacial Lake Passaic. That road is built through the low part of the gap of the mountains. Engineers put roads at the lower parts because it's easier to build there. So the, the ice was here, we think, a few thousand years. As the ice retreated, it left behind the terminal moraine. That is a large pile of this sediment brought down by the glacier from the north. This is deposited in the lake in the form of they'll take deposits that stacked up several hundred feet thick um, in a line roughly from Short Hills up to Morristown. This, this moraine um, plugged the Short Hills Gap. As the glacier retreated, the, the Passaic River could not regain its former outlet out of the basin. Instead, the ice kept, the ice front retreated, the lake advanced with it. The lake got bigger. But as the ice retreated further north, it unveiled lower elevations in the Watching, watching Mountains than at Moggy Hollow. There's what we call the summit stage of glacial Lake Passaic. That's about elevation of 320 feet. The lake would have dropped about 20 foot when that outlet was uncovered. And by the way, I'm, this, this geologic history can be very complex, and I'm simplifying it uh, to a great deal. I apologize to the, to the glacial geologists in the audience for, for doing so. But the ice kept moving north. It finally hit the great notch stage at that elevation 305 feet. Ike drove up today from, um, from the um, Newark area up over the great notch. And up, as I drove over the notch and I went down, I imagined entering Glacial Lake Passaic at that point. So, but I think it's kind of fun to imagine what used to be here uh, instead of what is there now. Well, the ice kept melting. The ice front kept retreating until finally um, the ice revealed the gap at Little Falls, about one, elevation 185. So that, at that point, um, the Passaic River found that elevation and then started resuming the course that we know today. The ice kept retreating further north and north and even yet more, and finally it was all gone out of New Jersey. We think this happened maybe 10,000 years ago. We're not sure, but it, on that order, which again is very, very recent in geologic time. But it left behind a number of daughter lakes. The elevation of the lake bottom was lower than the outlet elevation, as much as 20 feet in places. So these daughter lakes remained behind. There was a major one to the south of the moraine and a few to the north of the moraine. And these daughter lakes stayed there, and they just, well, they, they just were, uh, were remnants, and they stuck around for thousands of years behind after, the, after glaciation. This is the um, topography of the Passaic Basin, Central Passaic Basin, right now. These daughter lakes are all gone. Daughter lakes were common in glacial areas. In the American West, where it was dry, when the lakes dried up, leaving behind the flat lake bottoms. Here is the Bonneville Salt Flats, which is the remnant of glacial Lake Bonneville. New Jersey is not dry. In New Jersey, when the, when the swamps, when the glacier retreated, what was the daughter lakes filled up, leaving behind the swamps. Here's a picture of a great swamp. As floodwaters came in, the sediments would go to the lowest elevation and gradually fill up. It's been 10,000 years, slowly fill up. Also, the swamp deposits, the peat, all the marsh grasses, as they died, um, they also helped fill the swamps up. So the swamps, that, all the swamps you see in the basin are generally the grandchildren then of Glacial Lake Passaic. All these swamps were left behind. And then that also governs the drainage characteristics of the basin. You have the Rampo River Basin to the north, 
uh, Wanaku Clinic, about 378 square miles, um, down to two bridges. The Passaic Basin, which is um, to above two bridges, about 361 square miles. Um, there is a, the red dot on this is the stream gauge at Little Falls. That's a very important gauge for us for monitoring the conditions in the basin. What's the point is that there are hundreds of square miles to the upstream of that gauge. You can also note on, on the screen, all the fluorescent green is, are the current swamps. From south to north, you have the Great Swamp, Black Meadows, Lee Meadows, Troy Meadows, Hatfield Swamp, Long Meadows, Great Peace Meadows, Bog and Vly Meadows. There's no lack of low-lying wet areas in the Central Pacific Basin. Now, they are attractive for some purposes. The, perhaps the um, most attractive um, is for airports. They're nice, flat ground. Right now, the Black Meadows is, to a great extent, covered by the Morris County Airport. Long Meadows is covered, partially, by the Essex County Airport. In 1959, there was a serious proposal by the Port Authority to take 10,000 acres out of the Great Swamp to turn it into a major airport for the New York area. And local opposition to this, however, killed the project and helped jumpstart the environmental um, movement in New Jersey. What I want to do now is zoom in to the outlet area from the Central Basin, where the, where the Passaic River flows out. You have the Pompton River coming down from the north, flowing through a, a narrow gap in Hook Mountain. It then joins the Passaic River, and then the river flows to the east and the northeast, flowing past Little Falls and Great Falls. The Watchung Mountains here, shown in the brownish colors, again, these are underlain by the basalts, the, the erosional resistant rocks. They form the highlands, the uplands around here, and they hold the water back. Here is the current land use in the area showing Singac, Wayne, and Fairfield um, close to the rivers. What I want to do is look at the elevations involved. Here I've grayed out all the elevations that are either greater than 200 feet elevations or less than 100. I've also put on here what we think of roughly the daughter lakes from, um, from um, Glacial Lake Passaic. Now once the daughter lakes dried up, what was left behind was this elevation. These are five foot elevation contours. That is, we have um, 195, 190 in the red and orange, and then grading down in color to the blues, that are 110, 105. The point here is that down at near the rivers, the land is very flat. There's not a lot of elevational um, change in these wetlands. This is also reflected in the FEMA data. These are the FEMA maps for Passaic and Essex counties in this particular area, showing both the floodways and the hatched areas are the 100-year floodplain. Again, we're seeing the, the interconnection here, the interplay between the geology that's governing the path of the water and the hydrology of where the water is going to go when it comes down. Zooming in at the Little Falls area, here's a picture from 1902, the Passaic River at Little Falls. It looks quite different now if you've been to it, but in 1902, was, there wasn't a lot of development at that point. Hydrologists have long recognized that it's this elevation here that governs the, uh, the elevation of the swamps upstream. The, the water can't get any lower than this. This basalt, this gap in the basalt here, this is basalt at the bottom of the river. It's this elevation, you can't get anything lower than that upstream. It's the erosional base for the central basin. This was realized in the 1800s. People, people thought that, well, if we could just take, take this basalt and make it lower, maybe we can drain the swamps. At that time, 1900, people knew swamps were unhealthy. Near swamps, people got sicker. They died at an earlier age, generally, near the swamps. Property values were much less near the swamps than they were in healthier upland areas nearby. So if someone could lower this diabase um, somehow and turn Great Peace Meadows into dry, productive land, they could make a lot of money. Well, they tried. They, they lowered this by a few feet, but it's very hard rock. It, uh, they didn't get very far, 
and they couldn't raise enough money to actually make a significant change, but they tried at the time. Troy Meadows, here's an 1889 map of Troy Meadows. There are straight lines in the meadows, if you look at it closely. There are some straight lines running across it. Those are drainage ditches, and they are still there today, if you go out there. They were an attempt to drain Troy Meadows. The problem was, it's so flat, there's no place for the water to go. They got some flow pass through there, but it wasn't enough to make a big difference. In the mid-1980s, I was doing some field work on the east edge of Troy Meadows, and I'm out there looking for wells to measure water levels. And an old man, who seemed old to me, he was probably in his mid-80s at the time, um, came out, and we were talking about the history of the area, and explained what I was doing. And he said that when he was a young man, so early 1900s, he had met an old man. And that old man told him about seeing freed slaves digging these trenches by hand in the meadows in an attempt to drain them and make them more productive. That didn't work. But it's, there's a long history of trying to better the drainage of this area to make the water run away faster, to, to, to drain the swamps, to lower the floods. Let's look at the past floods. This is a slide of the annual peak flow as measured at Little Falls. The 2011 value there shows the flow from Irene. That's about 20,800 CFS. It's a flood peak of around 14.7 feet elevation at Little Falls, based on the reference there. But you look at it, there are larger floods. 1810, 1865, 1902. And the worst flood there is 1903. At Little Falls, the peak flow is around 31,700 CFS. That's one and a half times as great as Irene in, in 2011. The flood stage there was 17.5 feet, over three feet higher in the 1903 flood than observed during Irene. In 1903, that was an October flood. Precipitation ranged on the highlands from 10 to 14 inches. Um, east of the highlands, ranged from 15 to 12. The average they figure over the entire basin was around 11 and 3 quarters inch rainfall over that basin. It had huge, huge effects in the area. Patterson flooded horribly. At that time, Patterson was a major industrial city, and the 1903 flood caused millions of dollars of damage, and that's millions of 1903 dollars. So that would be a whole lot more if that same level of flood would occur today. And that, of course, resulted in a bunch of studies. What happened? Why is that, that flood so bad? The first study came out in 1904. It was a simple analysis of showing what precipitation was, what the floods were. But their analysis showed that to anyone making an inspection, especially within the city of Patterson, it is readily apparent that the riverbed has, for years, been considered a legitimate field for encroachment. That is, there are too much building in the floodplain. People were putting themselves in harm's way. There were design problems, too. The 1902 flood, just the year before, had been a major flood and washed out some bridges. They were rebuilt, and some of them were washed out again in 1903. So they, people weren't really, were doing the best they could, but they weren't planning, thinking about things could get worse. The realization that building in the floodplain is going to be uh, problematic was not new. George Perkins Marsh was a kind of a remarkable man. He was a, a linguist, a scholar, a diplomat. Um, he's considered to be one of the founders of American environmental studies. Um, he was, while in Italy, as ambassador to Italy, he um, researched and wrote a book called Man and Nature, 1864. He was looking at why Europe was different than America. And one big important, one major factor he found, he believed, was humans. Humans were a huge cause in landscape changes. And then he looked at flooding issues. Why did Europe have such huge flooding problems? And, and they weren't huge in America. Here is what he said. The summer floods with the United States are attended with less pecuniary damage than in Europe. 
It's partly because the banks of American rivers are not yet lined with towns. Their shores and the bottoms which skirt them not yet covered with improvements whose cost is counted by millions. And consequently, a smaller amount of property is exposed to injury by inundation. Let us be wise in time and profit by the heirs of our older brethren. What he's saying is that we should be aware. They've made mistakes. Europeans have built themselves into a corner. Let's not do that. Again, back to 1889, a, a map of the um, outlet area. 2005, the USGS quad maps. And then on this map, the pink and the purple show developed areas. Well, we've done so-so. There are there's a bunch of development in the floodplains, but then a lot of the plains haven't been developed yet. Great piece of meadows, bog and blood meadows. So I'm um, 50-50, I, I don't look at it. But the 1903 flood was transformative in how New Jerseyans looked at, at flooding and what could be done. And there were a lot of proposals that come out of that. Remember, 1903, much different land use patterns than currently. There were a lot of proposals to, uh, to limit future floods. Um, channel cleaning was one, to, to make the water run out to sea faster. But there are also a number of proposals for flood control reservoirs in the upstream basin. Now, I want to emphasize that I'm going to show you some slides. None of these reservoirs are still on the books. None of them were, were built at the time, and none of them are under consideration now. But they're interesting to look at from a historical perspective. The first example was Little Falls, or Great Passaic Reservoir. The blue area in the center basically recreates Glacial Lake Passaic. They would have put a dam across Little Falls, and everything north of upstream of that, up to elevation of 192 when full, um, would have been flooded, or at least reserved for flood storage. Now, a flood control reservoir normally doesn't have water in it. That's the whole idea. You put it there, and it's dry until it floods. And as soon as it floods, you let the water out. So you can't use it for recreation in the summer because it's busy either a flood filling or draining quickly so that you get ready for the next flood. So most of the time, it is mud flats. But when, it, when you need it, it's there. Had this reservoir been built, there would have been no more flooding downstream of Little Falls. It would, have, it would have been big enough to capture all the runoff, but it would have flooded a huge area. And, and even at that time, it was not feasible. One area it would have flooded was Singak. So that had a number of homes in 1903. Next proposal was just to go upstream of Singak near two bridges and run a dam, it was a longer dam than the Little Falls Dam, from um, one end of Hook Mountain down to some higher elevations in the south. Again, 192 elevation on full. Next proposal, Whippinong Reservoir. Um, dam up the Rockaway and the Whippany. Um, at that point, we can see the, the blue here, which is Jersey City Reservoir, Bootin Reservoir, was built in 1903, already there. And this dam would have backed the water up close to the bottom of it. Now, the next proposal, Mountain View Reservoir. Put a dam across Mountain View, uh, Hook Mountain, and dam up the Pompton to the north. And that would have uh, held back all the floodwaters from the north. There was also an additional proposal that came out earlier, the Rampo Reservoir. Where the Pompton Lakes Dam is, the suggestion was that's about elevation 210, I believe. Make that 90 feet higher, 300 foot elevation. When full, that flood pool would have stretched back up to New York State up until about the throughway, when it was full from a major storm. Again, there was too much infrastructure already in the floodplain, too many people, too many homes, too many transportation corridors to make that a feasible proposal. But it was interesting to see what people thought of at the time. So this all occurred in uh, 1903, when it was a much different land use pattern than today. Here is a current land use on this slide the pink is developed land. You can see that large parts of the Wanaku and Pequannock reservoirs or watersheds are still woods. However, a lot of the Passaic, Whippany, um, and, and Rampo have been developed. Here's what happened when Irene hit um, last year. East Coast, as it came up the East Coast, the areas got different amounts of water. Most of southern New Jersey got around seven inches or a little less. 
in the Rampa River watershed, it ranged from 8 inches up to 11.5, with an average of around 9.6 on an area-wide basis. But remember, the 1903 flood was about 11 and 3 quarters on average, more than 2 inches greater than Irene. And it occurred on a watershed that was more wooded, much more wooded than currently. The point is that if the 1903 flood were to occur today, the flooding would probably be greater than it was observed in 1903 due to watershed development. So the summary of my talk is that the geology and hydrology intersect. The geology has caused the high ridges that, fo that form the, that hold the water in. The, the river has to flow through these narrow gaps in the ridges and just can't get through fa uh, fast enough when it floods. The glacial history has resulted in flat lake bottoms that a little bit of water lake bottoms can flood large areas. Nice reservoirs to hold the water when it does flood. And the development in the floodplains has created additional problems, um, just people, putting people in harm's way. The 20, 2011 report came out with this conclusion. The continued development in the Passaic River Basin over the floodplain of the last 100 years has continued to compound an already long-term problem. The reality is that state and local governments have allowed development to continue in floodplains, and so the consequences of flooding have become more severe and comprehensive, and flood mitigation more elusive. The DEP commissioner last month. So the fact of the matter is, it's flooded for 10,000 years. It's going to flood in the future. Edward, St Edward Stark might say, floods are coming. Thank you very much.